Okay. Because I have small. No, it's okay, like this. No, no. no. Uh, no, maybe you help her. You can help her. Thank you. Thank 
What am I supposed to talk about? Really? I'm so telling you, darling, this is a day, and the simple example, Chanju Sim Kandese, Sim Yaji Tangore, Zoraji, darling, Ibada. So it seems that today the topic that we're going to discuss is how to generate a kind heart and how to develop bodhicitta. So sorry, today I look like a bird perched on a high branch <laughs> on this high throne. <laughs> I don't feel very comfortable. Any call number? Any? So there are very precious people on my right and also on my left and among you there are many people who are highly qualified with great qualities and so I feel quite uncomfortable here perched high like a bird. So. <laughs> I wanted to sit over here on Fabrizio's cushion, but they wouldn't let me, saying that people wouldn't see me. Yeah, yeah, I Okay, it doesn't matter. <laughs> So it seems that many of you have come from very far away. So anyways, for three days now, it seems we will gather here every evening for Dhamma Talks. So it seems there are many new people here too. So there must be also many people who don't know me. So since there is this custom of uh, introducing oneself when one meets new people, 
So it's quite easy to introduce myself. I'm just an ordinary Tibetan girl whose uh, country has been taken away. And I don't have any particular qualities in terms of education, like uh, taking teachings from a teacher and going to school and things like that. So there are many lamas who say different things that I am the manifestation of this and that deity, but I do not accept that. And the only thing I accept, accept is that I'm a girl and that I'm a human being. So for these three evenings that we will spend together in the following days, I think we should do our best to not waste our time at this occasion. So since all of you are very busy people, you'll have work and jobs and things to do. You don't have a lot of free time, so I'll do my best so we don't waste our time here. So for everyday life and all the time and also for these three days, if we want our actions to ripen into positive fruits, um, then the first thing we should do is pay attention to our motivation. So whether we um, achieve a positive or a negative result, it seems it depends on our motivation. And also, particularly mm, regarding such talks as talking about uh, bodhicitta and emptiness, mm, merely mentioning uh, these, uh, these topics allows us to accumulate huge amounts of merit. So to start, we will take ourselves as an example and then turn around to uh, observe all limitless sentient beings and observe that they all want to be happy and that they don't want to suffer and that in this way we are exactly the same. Dungy 
Yahu sonadana Dini Dile Timbi Tiki Ting La Yunjoji Simji Miam Tundro Tama Loa Dini and Ji Pama Jipi Pugunajin Zi and Zambuni Tikala Kangba Tikala Matsu Rusini So do you re Che Zang Di Tama Loa Dunga Mandevata Devan Deva Chikware Tiso Tama Loa Devi Ju Drip to Vashu and Dungenda, Cherva show, D. Chedula, and the Simjan Samalo, D. G. Yung and Chedula, Tiring as a drolling chair, Chen, Gombajirona. The cui siamo esattamente uguali a tutti gli altri. So, even though all sentient beings want to uh, avoid suffering, uh, even though they might want to avoid suffering, they do not know how to abandon the causes of suffering, and even though they want to be happy, they do not know how to uh, accomplish the causes of happiness. And so they practice in a way that is completely opposite to what they deeply wish for. They are just like a blind person lost in a very vast valley, not knowing where north, east, and west are. So not knowing what is wholesome and what is harmful. Mm. One achieves the causes of suffering instead of achieving the causes of happiness, and one avoids the causes of happiness instead of engaging in them. And so we practice and we act in a way that is completely contradictory to our deep wish and longing. And this is the case for all sentient beings. So keep that in mind as we engage in this talk. This, we can say maybe a Dharma talk, but actually I don't know anything about the Dharma, so it's really a general talk that is a general discussion that I will do. Maybe some Dharma words will come here and there, but that's all. And so we have to remember that all sentient beings with whom we share the whole world, the planet, we share the planet in such a way that it is our home, and we are like uh, the children. So whether we accept Dharma or not, the fact that uh, we're all the same in wanting happiness and not wanting uh, suffering, we're the same. So we're like the children uh, sharing the same planet, the same house, like brothers and sisters. Even for someone who doesn't accept uh, religion. Mm, they never um, want to suffer for themselves. Everyone just wants to experience pleasure and happiness. So in our lives, we have all kinds of educations and trainings that we do. Many things that we can learn that are so precious. Because all of these that we do, all these studies, etc., that we do, is for the sake of being happy and not suffer. All the studies that we do, the works, the jobs, the food, and clothing, all these things, we have one main objective for all these things, is to be happy. So nowadays, uh, in the outer world, the material world, we've seen so much progress and so much uh, improvement in the favorable conditions, material conditions. Zambulingi 
So with such a progress, um, it means that in now we even have in our hands, we can all the good and the bad, all the games, and um, it's like a game to see the whole world in our hand. So all these things provide a lot of benefits, of course. So it's a, this technological progress um, provides a lot of uh, many very precious and useful things, very fast in terms of communication, in terms of in many fields. But then all together with that, it provokes a lot of harm too. So because of all these new technologies and this, uh, the industrial progress, our house, which is the planet, has been damaged and the environment has been damaged tremendously. And all the factories and these things are polluting the air in such a way that is the pollution spreads so um, quickly uh, that the survival on earth is getting more and more difficult and this is all created by man. And because of um, the disturbance of the outer four elements, also the inner elements are disturbed, and therefore this creates so many um, terrible sicknesses. Tana Jacob Susuki Sungi and then when you see all different countries for the sake of uh, self-protection and self-preservation create all kinds of terrible weapons such as bombs etc for using the excuse or that uh, this is for the protection of one's own race, one's own people, and one's own nation. And so with this objective in mind, they create terrible things and weapons that actually, as, as a result, only harm others and oneself. So, what do we actually need? We need a Mm, in terms of conduct and in, her, in terms of view, we need something positive. So 
So however much we manage to cultivate a vast mental attitude, and the more we will be uh, honest, and the more we're honest, the more we'll be kind. Therefore, the question comes up, how do we improve ourselves? It is very clear that to develop a positive view and positive conduct is not going to happen by merely praying for it. Whether it comes to our work or any action that we do, even to grow a flower, we need to understand the concordant causes that give rise to the result that we want. Therefore, one needs to recognize was this the cause and the, the causes and the conditions of the suffering that we want to avert. In order to abandon it, first we need to recognize where it comes from, and then we can get organized, if you will. Therefore, we have to understand that we have physical sensations and mental sensations. So there are two dimensions here. And these two are mutually interdependent. Therefore, continuously in our daily lives, we have to understand that we have the type of happiness and suffering that comes mainly on the basis on, of our physical sensations and the happiness and suffering that happen mainly on the basis of our mental sensations. So it seems it's important to understand both sides. So it is very clear that uh, when it comes to the um, physical sensations, it, they arise, we interact with them with our five uh, sensory consciousnesses. And so we have what we apprehend as pleasurable physical sensations and painful physical sensations, which are uh, quite coarse. And usually we mainly interact with those or engage with those. So continuously in our daily lives, we always uh, engage with regard to form, taste, sound, smell, and touch. 
And we consider the pleasurable aspects of those as being the unique source of our happiness, and that all our happiness depends on this. And we look for our happiness in this, and we trust these objects to provide us with happiness. And so mainly all our presentations, I mean all our ideas of um, happiness and pain lies only on that level. And we, whether we and, and indulge ourselves or fight and argue, it is mainly based on that level. <laughs> So for us, uh, what we understand as uh, consciousness or awareness, we understand it only through the scope of the outer material science, not from the inner dimension. But the most important is to understand um, mental dimension from the inner psychological point of view. And in, from this perspective, we can understand a very deep, we can get a very deep understanding of happiness and suffering. So, there is such a wisdom that we could uh, use um, and we can open tremendously, limitlessly. But uh, failing to understand that, instead, we, have, we develop some kind of intelligence that only goes under the sway of the delusions and that is only used by the delusions. Sempre nel processo di cercare di essere so anyways, it seems that what happens is that we truly fall into a very big mistake. So, for example, people like you have a very great knowledge and education in terms of uh, the worldly ways, and so you have a very high and very sharp intelligence and a very positive intelligence that is such that you understand all that happens in the world from your own, from from your experience. You know clearly all these things. <laughs> But still, you can continue to open up your wisdom to reach e even a higher level of uh, wisdom, much more precious. No. So 
Therefore, for us, we have to investigate what are the causes of uh, suffering, what is the source of suffering, what are the causes of happiness, what are, is the source of happiness, what is the root of all this. I think it is time now that we investigate this reality. Tijundumisinala, so continuously in life, we engage in all these, mostly in all these things that pertain to form, taste, sound, smell, and touch. But in the end, all these things turn out to be in the nature of suffering. How are they in the nature of suffering? And what is their nature in themselves? And what is this mind that apprehends them or that understands them or clings to them? How do, do these things appear to this mind? How do these things actually abide, exist? So it is very, very important to use our intelligence to distinguish between what is positive or helpful and what is negative. And plus, in this world, there are so many, many very precious religious, religions. We need a reason to say that they are precious, right? So most religions um, and their founder or their god or whatever, uh, most of them say that all sentient beings should not be harmed and that one should be honest and truthful and kind. So these advices are very useful. Oh, but then when it comes to what we call chu or dharma, we have to think about whether we want to accept it or not. Therefore, if we want to practice Dharma, we have to ask ourselves these questions. Through the practice of the Dharma, what is to be accomplished? What is the result that we are striving for? And who is the agent of the practice? Who is accomplishing the Dharma? In Buddhism, we, we talk of the four mistaken views that are based on the four seals. This is whether we accept Dharma or not, just knowing about the Dharma, 
allows us to find new tools to look for happiness. We understand different levels of happiness, temporary happiness, ultimate happiness, and all the different kinds of happiness or pleasurable events that are very relative. Then through ascertaining reality, we can generate a very strong experience of what are these four mistaken views. So if we first understand really well the state of the, what we call the basis or the state of things, then we have a very useful tools in our hands to know how to practice the spiritual path and we become a very capable of achieving the result. So, in brief, what we mean by the word basis, uh, it comes into two categories. One is the outer uh, material world, and one is the inner mental world. Or oh, one is outer, the object, what is apprehended, and the inner world of what is apprehending the agent of the understanding. So, however we might identify what is the outer object that is apprehended or the inner consciousness that is apprehending, we, it, it seems it's very important to ascertain what is their actual mode of existence. Rangjin So, when we talk about the nature or the character of the mode of abiding um, of the apprehended and the apprehending consciousness, uh, when we understand that, we understand what we mean by a proper view or unmistaken view or pure view. Um, it means that in our in the mind, in our mind stream. Uh, we understand the object and the object possessor, the mind and the object, as being in nature, voidness. No. So usually when we say voidness or void, we might usually think, oh, this refers to something that is like a space or like the sky, basically something where there's nothing at all. Okay. 
l'impressione che sia il nulla, il nulla totale, come un'assenza totale di tutto, ci stiamo sbagliando completamente. Non so. Tongba di Rizzi, sono ancora in alto, ti tongba di Rizzi, no? Ma se cupa sciuro, ma se io ero. Ma se tu, tu, tra, tu, tre, tu, rondo, resta, tu, zangendo, catu, tu, ti muoio di su io ero, 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 ti muoio di su io So if we thought that there was nothing at all, that was completely, that would be completely stupid because it's uh, completely, obviously, uh, contradictory with um, reality. Well, there is form, there is taste, there is sound, there is smell, there is object of touch, there is positive, there is negative, there is joy, there is sadness. It would be completely crazy to deny all these things that are obvious. <laughs> Sentiamo i suoni, proviamo i sapori, i gusti, le, le emozioni, per cui dire che siamo nulla è completamente contrario alla realtà, non, non andrebbe bene. Non so. Da di indi, da di di no, ha detto la santa angolese, la no? Then, if it is like this, how should we think? Someone might wonder like that. Ma se no, giunto in simna la zindang di giva shiuzi. No, Dardola, the interruption is in the ass. Zimba, Zindang di, no, Dardola, Timber Tru and Zin. Suktuba Zimba, Juba Mevan Zimba. So, usually, continuously in our lives, we um, apprehend things uh, in a very, very big way, uh, thinking that things exist truly and concretely as they appear to us. We think they are very solid and that they never change. So we think that things exist by way of their own nature, and especially when we think of the self, I, we feel this is something that is so solid and concrete and permanent and real, and that it never changes. So one mistake is to uh, consider things that are not established inherently as being established inherently. And then the opposite. Clinging to something inexistent as being existent. The overestimated, uh, overestimating conceptual thought. Uh, makes us believe in something that doesn't exist, believe that it exists, and we cre this creates a lot of problems for us. Therefore, in each and every one of us, we all have a mind that is mistaken and a mind that is unmistaken. And this is something we all have innately, naturally. Mm. 
If things uh, were established truly and inherently just as they appear to us, if the I, for example, existed exactly as we apprehend it to exist, in, namely autonomously and permanently, if it was like that, then how would we become uh, big from being a small child? How would we become old from being a young adult? It would be impossible. But all these things, these phenomena, we see them happen. So look closely what we trust, what we believe as being very precious, all these things. And so because of clinging to the inherent existence of all these things, such as as they appear to us, such as form, taste, sound, smell, and object of touch, we apprehended and cling to them as existing exactly as they appear to us. And on this basis, we generate attachment, we generate aversion, we generate indifference. And because of these three mindsets, these three reactions, well, then we generate all elaborations, all other constructions. Our very home, the, the world. Mm, this world actually appears from the sphere of thusness. Actually, it came into existence through the coming together of the four elements in a concordant way, meaning that so many multiple um, atomic particles, subtler and coarser, uh, came together through a very long time. So when you think of your own situation even, so then when we think about what is the self, what is me, actually when we think about it closely, you see that actually it comes from the sperm and ovum of the parents, and this is on the basis on which we feel I. This is the basis that we label I. So sperm and uh, ovum coming together, and then the consciousness entering that, we feel very strongly, this is me, I. So 
Therefore, because we apprehend things as existent just as they appear to us, then if we do not see clearly through this clinging apprehension that we have, then we will continue to cling to um, suffering as being happiness. We think many things that are sufferings are actually in the nature of happiness. And because of that, we get attached to these things. So there are so many different things that are actually temporary pleasures, but actually turn out in the long run to be suffering. Actually, we call these things the excellences of samsara. So it, it includes so many different situations and events. So we call them excellences because actually it is true. On some perspective, on some level, they are positive. But we should wonder on what kind of uh, length of time can we trust them? Are they really long-term um, trustworthy on the long run? Are they limited? Are they unlimited? So we have to think about these things. So when it comes to pleasurable sensations and suffering sensations, we all have a very valid experience, direct first-hand experience. So when it comes to painful experiences, painful sensations, even though we might never want it, it always keeps coming. So what should we do about it? Where does it come from? So we all have attachment, aversion, ignorance. They've been with us for a long time. They're like our old buddies. So our very old friends, our best friends, our greed, ill will, self-centeredness, wrong views. Competitivity, jealousy. So these kind of feelings that they bring up, we never ever want them, but they keep happening, they keep coming. Therefore, if we don't look properly for a method that allows us to destroy them, actually we do try to find tools to get rid of those. We do all kinds of jobs. We accumulate money and possessions. So when we are unhappy, we go to different places. Maybe we go near the ocean or we do all kinds of things. Or we travel abroad. We make new friends. But these things, when we go away, they come with us. We, there's, no, there's no way to just uh, go somewhere else and leave them here and, and run away. They follow us like a shadow. 
So what should we do? We should destroy the root. So first we should recognize what is their root. So Shakyamuni Buddha is extremely kind. So he did when this he didn't first come through uh, the earth, he didn't come appear from the sky. This is not like that. He was just like us. Didn't want to suffer, wanted to be happy. He had, like us, many different sensations of happiness and suffering. So all these uh, sufferings that he wanted to destroy, that he destroyed, what are the causes, what are the conditions for all these sufferings? So when we investigate that, the Buddha investigating all these things saw that all the pleasurable events of this life were um, actually suffering and changing and uh, renunci renunciating all these things, he went away and looking for the inner happiness in his own mind from look, trying to understand the nature of the mind. So when he first turned the wheel of the Dharma, he started by explain, talking about this thing that this very thing that we have and we experience uh, firsthand, which is our own suffering. So destroying all, totally all the different types of sufferings by completely and totally uprooting all the causes of sufferings, he achieved enlightenment. So the term enlightenment or Buddha in Tibetan is Sankhya. The first syllable refers to uh, the complete destruction, annihilation of all sufferings. And the second syllable, Khe, means a state of a blooming of all the qualities, the blooming of all the happiness and the qualities of the mind, which is an extremely vast mind, um, a mind that there is nowhere that he does not pervade and there is nowhere that he does not illuminate and that is totally moved uh, through you know, by great compassion. So he achieved this state and um, explained happiness and suffering to us. This is the first Lo Tri Lo Dela Dangzi Maripa Sigidwa Maripa Tendisunangdwa. So we have to understand that in us we all have two different types of minds, those who are mistaken and those who are not mistaken. So let's first try to uh, probe into what is a mistaken mind. So in Buddhism we talk of the self grasping ignorance when we want to talk about mainly the confused mindsets. So we call it ignorance. Mm -hmm. 
ngaso dungi nam ju dung ngo shi de jin da sha shi dan ti mu gi za wa za wa yong so wa xing dong du ge ma so na an xing dong yi za wa de xing de tu xin zi na tu xin zi da dong bu da ya ka ji ya la za wa zi go ru wa di za wa di la da marik ba zi la ni ming te de zi da yong go ri de yin za ni ngaso marik ba di ha ho go go zi la So all the sufferings that we experience and that we know continuously in our lives, when we look for their very root, it is like a tree, a tree which has branches and a trunk, and let's say this tree is poisonous. Then if we want to get rid of the poisonous fruits and leaves and branches, then we need to completely uproot the tree in the same way to get rid of all the forms of sufferings that might um, overwhelm us. We need to uproot their very cause. So there are two types of ignorance. The ignorance that is blind with regard to the actual mode of abiding of phenomena and the ignorance that is blind with regard to the function mechanism of karma, actions and their results. So we're not talking here about something that has nothing to do with us. It's like laying a map of a place that we we'll never go to. We're talking about our very situation here. So basically, ignorance is a mind that is directly contradictory with reality. So as So as long as we're under the sway of a mind that is con totally contradictory with the actual mode of abiding of phenomena, basically reality, if we are under the sway of this mind, then we, are, we will remain as unenlightened, ordinary sentient beings. <laughs> But then from recognizing the true nature of reality and the true nature of our own minds, Meaning the enlightened Indian being's own mind realizes his own mind. When we see that, then all the confusion it breaks down and we generate a very precious type of unconfused mindset that we call also Rigpa awareness. Then this reality. So in terms of reality, there is a relative conventional dimension to reality. And then there is an ultimate, ultimate level of reality. Mm. So, the conventional uh, level of reality is what we engage in all the time continuously, what we, uh, on the basis of which we talk of good and bad, all these things that we can see, forms and colors, etc. 
So this is a reality that is true or real, relatively speaking, not ultimately. So if we want to generate the kind heart of bodhicitta, how should we generate it? If we want all this dimension to ripen into something very precious, Mm. So if it ripens through a very kind, a very wholesome types of mindsets, then naturally, automatically, a very wholesome conduct will automatically ensue. Uh, so the minds of sentient beings are mistaken, right? So let's think about how we live our life with this kind of mistaken mindset. So all the inner and outer phenomena are all in the nature of change. In the nature of impermanence. But this mistaken view clinging to permanence creates a lot of confusion. So let's think a minute about how and uh, how our mistaken mind clings wrongly to reality and how it makes us act. If we think closely to our impermanent nature, so we could understand a lot of it if we did think about it. But we do not think about our nature of impermanence. And we remain with a very strong apprehension of permanence. And on the basis of that, we generate very strong attachment and anger. Even if we were born uh, today, in a in hundred years, it is sure that we will be dead. But in our lives, we never think about that. In our daily experiences, we have a very strong clinging to permanence, and we think that we act as if we would live for a thousand years. Then the second step or the second mistaken mind is the apprehension of uh, what is dirty as being clean or pure. So I'm talking here about how our mistaken mindsets work, okay? So we're in the nature of something that is unclean, our body, etc. Corpo, corpo, so 
So look for a minute how we are confused with regard to our impure nature. Look at how we live our lives, uh, generating attachment, anger, and indifference with regard to these impure aggregates. In the end, even when uh, our hair is as turned completely white, look at how we act still. So look for a minute at that time what kind of meaningful actions have we led in our lives? How closer have we traveled towards bodhicitta, how vast and honest have we become and look at how uh, we are so confused with regard to what is clean and dirty, how completely foolish we are. Our very body, if we look at it very closely, what is the dirty and pure aspect of it? So the self that we are so deeply attached to and these friends towards which we feel so much love and attraction, what is it truly? Bloods and blood and skin and bones and uh, all kinds of fluids, etc. This is reality. <laughs> How can we feel attracted? How can we feel attached to this thing when we see its true nature? If you think about it one by one, you think about the blood and the bones and the skin and the inner organs. How can we be attracted to each and each of these um, parts in our body? Yeah, especially when we first enter the household life, meaning we get married. When we first fall in love and uh, engage in relationships, we see the other person as 100% beautiful and precious and valuable. Our mind is completely 100% engrossed with this person. The situation at the beginning of the relationship and the situation at the end of the relationship has completely different. Rangi 
Sim çür de vadi meto nangin de ye çare, rü çare. Dan oyu nüzü de şip yöngdü dini gemo geya de zoa mağancıya zor rüğru wa. Dini çambodan zangbo çeya de ya mağbo zi çam çam yöna çam çam yig rüğru. So why it, does it become like that? What, is, what makes this situation transform so drastically is because at the very beginning, seeing all this, uh, seeing the person as being completely positive is a completely mistaken mind. And so and we do not see at the beginning the reality, the actual mode of abiding of the person. We do not see what they really are. We see them as extremely precious and important and valuable and beautiful, but actually they are not like that from their own side. But we still cling to that thought of them being so completely uh, beautiful, etc. And we insist and indulge and cling at that situation. Then after three, four years, etc., of uh, spending together, well, we have to get along. And this becomes difficult because after a couple of years, this beautiful flower that had bloomed in our minds at the beginning of the relationship has become completely rotten and has to be thrown away. Way, even when it comes to smiling to each other. But we do not want to smile to each other. This is finished. And being sweet and kind to each other, well, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. So by clinging to what is impure as being pure, we uh, engage in so many different types of attachment and anger, and this way we just exhaust our life. La costruiamo e la finiamo sulla base della spinta dell'attaccamento e dell'avversione. Da? Tini? Tu che mi rangi la? And then again, the third mistaken view is to cling to what is actually suffering as being happiness. Da? Di nga so, nam giundu zonen ci hai ji, si pi pun zo tere. And so here, uh, this refers to what we uh, continuously indulge in and strive for, which we call the excellences of samsara. So all these things are namely food, clothing, fame, health, reputation, possessions, enjoyments, etc. So all these things, basically, we spend our lives trying to get those, striving to get those. But we need those things. Our illusory new body disaggregates. So this very body disaggregates are propelled by the three types of delusions. It was born uh, not out of free will, but under the sway of other factors, namely the three poisonous mindsets of attachment, anger, and ignorance. But uh, we need to survive, we need to take care of this body. We need everything. But there's a way we actually need it. There's a way we can do that. It's not because we need something that it necessarily means that we have to be attached to it. 
Because our mind is mistaken, we think that the excellences of samsara are the best and the most valuable and the greatest thing we could ever have. So we need these things and we need to act in accordance to these things. So we need them, all these form, taste, uh, sound, smell, and touch. We all need them. And we need uh, some kind of a sense of being famous and have a good reputation, etc. But we have to know what is the limit. Even if we had a very pretty body, we, could, we should not trust it. So, through the experience of form, taste, sound, smell, and touch, we do experience some kind of pleasurable sensation, but we should not consider it as being so great and precious. Why should we not trust these things? Because however precious they might be, they are in the nature of change, which means they change every second. In the end, they turn out to be in the nature of suffering. Therefore, something who grants us some kind of temporary pleasure but turns out to be in the long run in the nature of suffering, this is something we have to think again about. Do we, uh, we need to think about what we actually need in the long run for ourselves. Therefore, if we entrust ourselves in something that is actually in the nature of suffering, it's like deceiving oneself. All the problems and hardships just keep happening to us one after the other without interruption. So because of only uh, wishing and longing and striving for uh, things that actually turn out to be in the nature of suffering, but we think they are happiness, then when they show their true colors and actually suffering truly happens through those things, then we feel very dissatisfied and disappointed. So think about it carefully. On this world, there are two types of beggars. Some are beggars because they do not have anything to eat and do not have nice clothes to wear. Some 
And because of being deprived of food and shelter and clothing, the, these type of beggars um, have to beg in the streets for their survival, day-to-day -day survival. Another type of beggar Hmm. Someone who gives up everything for the sake of fame and money and possessions and reputation. Something who would give up anything for these things. And becomes a, a slave to these things. Which one of these two types of beggars is the worst one? And the actual poor beggar. Such a person only tries to survive uh, and that's why he's begging. He doesn't harm any other people. But are those beggars who are the slaves of fame and reputation and possessions, mm. they are in big danger of actually playing with the lives of so many people. However much they might have. Because of having an unlightened mind, an unlightened mind, this mind is empty. Mm. This, such a mind is so empty that uh, even if they had all the possessions of the whole world, then they would uh, start trying to take control or getting stuff on other planets even. They have no contentment. So, in brief, it means uh, not knowing how to have satisfaction and contentment. Therefore, if something is uh, uh, precious and uh, valuable, it becomes truly valuable if it is used for the sake of other uh, beings. It is, used, it is meaningful and valuable, truly, when it is used for others' welfare. Mm. Then if all these uh, great possessions and things one might have, if mm, we use them for the welfare of our country, of our people, if we use them through recognizing how all other sentient beings are just like us, wanting to be happy, not wanting to suffer, and therefore we use all we have to help them and make them happier, then we are truly, truly rich. Tamdu Minkona Chini Midila Shirakawchagmarwa. 
So through having uh, many precious possessions and uh, many uh, possessions and richnesses, etc., if we do not dare to use them for uh, ourselves and we do not use them even uh, to give them for others, so we do not dare to use it for anyone, then at the time of uh, death, then there is, uh, it is of no use at all. And uh, we uh, would like to give these things to our closed ones and uh, loved ones usually. But since we've had uh, arguments with our parents and our relatives, then we have no one to give our possessions to. And we end up uh, give them to our pet animals, maybe to our dog or our cats. So these people, even they might be extremely rich, actually it is really uh, a sad situation because uh, if you only follow fame and reputation and accumulation of possession in your life, then no one will appreciate you and no one will get along with you. Then in the end of your life, you end up having to 
um, give your possessions to your pet animals because there's no one around. Um, and when you're in such a state, even when you see other people, you feel very upset and uh, get angry immediately as soon as something doesn't go your way. Then if you live your life in this way, at the time of death, you do not have anything to take with you, even uh, one needle or one thread you cannot uh, take with you. So all those nice things that you've accumulated around you, they just turn to dust, dust and are absolutely useless. And maybe other people will use them, but that's that's all. So what is the, you might wonder, then how to live our life in a beneficial or useful way uh, so we don't end up like this? Then you look what you have right now today. Precious human rebirth, you have got it, you have received it. And maybe some kind of finances, you have uh, relatively some kind of uh, finances. So whatever you have, use it to help others. Maybe try to help some schools, maybe some old people's home. Be kind to all other sentient beings around you, your parents, your family members, and so on and so forth. And so you, know, you help others, trying to protect them from hardships and problems. And if you live your life in this way, as long as you're alive, you are truly rich, and when you pass away, you are also rich because all you would have done with your possessions would have been useful. And so, the thing that we have to keep in mind is that we have to use our possessions, we have to use all we have to get a positive result, a precious result. And so this, again, is to be understood in terms of happiness and suffering. And, to, and so we need to understand what are the causes and conditions that create happiness and that create suffering. Because happiness and suffering are dependent origination. They are interdependent. So the causes of happiness are altruism, non-violence, trying to help others, trying to protect others from harm and from suffering. And through these intentions will automatically uh, arise different actions, Will and these actions will in turn give rise to um, experiences of happiness. In the same way, the cause and conditions of suffering are harming other sentient beings, verbally, physically, or mentally, you know, like giving them uh, poisonous attitudes or harm them in different ways. Whether we accept a religion or not, this is a fact because happiness and suffering are dependent origination and they are um, controlled by the mechanism of dependent origination. It's like uh, even a flower which needs all kinds of conditions such as water and warmth, etc., to grow. So you know, is this the same with happiness and suffering? <laughs> so in the end, <laughs> so today we talked about the negative views. So the last one. So the, so the first three mistaken views. Mm. So, mm, the uh, last of the four mistaken views acts as a root and as a foundation for the three other wrong views. So, it, uh, it is explained as the uh, concept that there is a self uh, when actually there is no self, meaning there is no inherent nature. So, in spite of all outer and inner phenomena being dependent origination, uh, we, con we consider them as being endowed by self when they have no self. So, 
So because of this, it's all upside down. Our whole, our whole opinion on, on our life and our whole behavior is completely confused and opposite to what reality is because of this false view. We, uh, under its way, we engage in attachment, aversion, ignorance, and this is because we ignore what reality truly is. So, because of this false view, we cling to things as existing uh, totally as they appear to us which means we cling to them as being completely solid, autonomous, true, concrete. If these things existed exactly as uh, we were clinging to them, as they appear to us autonomously, then we should be able to find them. Mm. Is there something that we can find that does not depend on any other factor, that does not rely on any other factor, that does not enter into contact on, with any other factor? Please look for it. Mm. Is there something that can never degenerate? Look, did something like that appear in the past? Is there something right now in the present? Is there something like that that will appear in the future? Except the actual mode of abiding of phenomena, the true nature of phenomena, everything else is uh, in the nature of degeneration and change. For example, we cling to the self to exist as it appears to me, thinking me. So please look for this self um, to check whether it exists truly as it appears. Now, the fact that you cannot find it, we will all come to this conclusion. And uh, also, we understand that it exists. So if we look for the I, the self, uh, among all the different parts of the aggregate, then we can see that each and every part has also its own name and that it is not the I. So we look everywhere for this very concrete I. We cannot find it anywhere. But the fact that it exists, we understand it on the basis of our feeling. So the way in which it exists, the eye, is upon de uh, in dependence upon many different factors, causes and conditions, etc. 
Jean Javati Chuji Mombuzilla Tony Javari, Jean Jingrolo Chuji Mombuzilla, Jivi Cochiniri. Now, our own, our very own production or birth uh, happened due to many causes and conditions, and our death and deterioration will also happen on the basis of many, many different causes and conditions. Therefore, uh, uh, very precious master, Nakajuna said, say that uh, whatever is dependent origination is called emptiness because anything that exists in dependence upon many different factors does not exist from its own side. And whatever is imputed in dependence upon other phenomena, this we call the middle way. That's what Nagarjuna says. What do we mean by middle way? not losing the presentation of existence. What exists does not exist autonomously, concretely. But then also we do not lose the presentation of inexistence. Mm. Uh, the more we understand the mode of emptiness, we see that whatever exists appears from the midst of dependent origination. And all the minds and form, taste, sound, smell, and touch, etc., all appear through dependent origination. While its nature is void of inherent nature. So when we say, oh, the meaning of um, emptiness is the perfect view, not falling in the extreme of verification, not falling in the extreme of nihilism, one follows in the middle the perfect view that is in the nature to bring forth all benefits and happiness. So now for us, we have a human body. We call that a human body. And on the basis of this, we have a very particular intelligence, a very precious intelligence. David So, 
If we use this uh, very bright intelligence, very precious intelligence that we have, we can use it so that we can find true stable happiness, not just temporary happiness that will uh, turn against us in the end through its nature of change, but a very stable, limitless happiness, and not only for ourselves, but for also innumerable sentient beings. Through this uh, bright and precious intelligence, we can develop actions and activities that are able to fulfill all the wishes of sentient beings and act for their welfare. So uh, if we could uh, generate a very vast mental attitude, more kindness and more honesty, uh, that would go in this direction. And we have all... And we have all we need to do that. So it seems we can have to continue this discussion tomorrow about uh, the nature, precious nature of the mind because today time has run out. Let's do now the dedications and prayers. We started with the motivation of Bodhicitta. Zambling Nala, Simjana Pentoniji, Sanjay the Chanju Simba Mamu, Yuri, Dimati, any chew my in by in a Mitsachimbo, did a Mizambo, Mitambo Mambo Yuri, the Susama Law at Sering Boyonga, any Zambling the Shide Yongaji, Matongwaman Jibo. And so let's uh, dedicate now for the sake uh, of all sentient beings, uh, particularly for the long life of all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who manifest on this earth, and all the kind-hearted, honest and precious beings, who, whoever they might be, whether they're Buddhist or even non-Buddhist. May they have a long life and be healthy, and may their wishes be fulfilled, and may there be peace in the world. So we started with the very positive mindsets of Bodhicitta at the beginning of the practice, and now we will conclude in this way with these dedications. Yeah, um, zila. Yeah. <laughs> Sani <laughs> Simjurim Bojim, Maja Palanji, Jawa Yamba, Meva Yang, Kuni, Kondo, Pepper, Shu, Chimba, the Unpunda, Zambote, and the Yendi, the Kunji, Chesu, the Roots, Kevan, the Tamji, Rabdu, Shiva, Jawa, Tamji, Mogala, Chodo, Mogaji, and the Kivit, and the Zambo Chiji Rabdu Mawaji Zundan Jovela Chiji Zendi Kanji Tindrung Chana Bemo Tindri Chandra So Dibzo Chindu Nandu Grazie.